Hello and welcome to The Shakedown. Our mission is to inform people about how the criminal justice system works, the real people impacted by the justice system, and methods to improve justice through compassionate and casual conversation. Hosts of The Shakedown share over 50 years of combined personal experience dealing with Texas prisons and working to change the criminal justice system. And now, here's our show. everyone and welcome to the shakedown uh today we have a very special guest um we have ken good and um a little bit about ken good um he graduated from hardin simmons university in 1982 with a bachelor of arts degree he received a master of education degree in 1986 from tarleton state university a part of the texas a m system in 1989, he received his law degree from Texas Tech School of Law, where he was a member of the Texas Tech Law Review. Uh, Mr. Good has argued cases before the Supreme Court of Texas and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, along with numerous courts of appeals, included the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Today, we're talking about bonds and the criminal justice and anything else that comes up. So... Um, so, Ken, thank you um, again for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. I, I, I feel like I need to mention I was second generation Harden Simmons. My uh, mom and dad met at Harden Simmons. And um, also, it's really kind of scary that I graduated from law school in 1989. I think that was the year Taylor Swift and was born, uh, according to one of her albums. And so I'm feeling very old recently. You know when Taylor Swift is born, so you're making me look old. <laughs> Hey, I am actually a living proof of one of those commercials about fathers and daughters getting closer uh, or having interactions because of the Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey thing. Oh, it's crazy. Good. My daughter and I, she set up a, a, a group chat with her best friend who is a big total Swifty. And I mean, the first two or three days I, I said I was so embarrassed by how many posts we'd put on there. And she's like, welcome to a girl chat. Well, that's I have thoroughly enjoyed it just talking to my daughter over stupid stuff, yeah. just Excellent. having fun. Actually, I just had a, uh, had a board meeting today and Taylor Swift came up in the board meeting. You can honestly, you can, you cannot escape Taylor Swift. That's the world. We Ryan, live in now. you brought that up. You and brought her up. So that doesn't count. If only, if only I show off my true, um, Taylor <laughs> Swift fandom, but, Let's talk about, uh, so your specialty is um, bail bonds and in the industry and the importance. Do you want to um, talk about that and your thoughts about bonds, the importance and things we can do to like help improve um, bonds and also criminal justice in general? Sure. You know, um I started out as an attorney representing doctors and hospitals when they got sued. I mean, I've been on court TV representing a doctor, and they said, you know, you're going to lose, and you're going to lose. You're going to have a verdict against you for $5.9 million, and, and we end up winning. Uh, and so I also have done a lot of appellate work, which you've already mentioned. But as a result of that, uh, someone called me having a bail bond issue, and so that kind of has now morphed into that's probably the primary area of my practice. I. I uh, represent a lot of bondsmen on when they have issues and not not trouble issues like they have just bond forfeitures and they need to have the right result uh, with, you know, whatever the law requires. But also represent some uh, Texas council for some entities uh, that write bail throughout the United States. And um, I was asked to go to a hearing in Houston at the very beginning of this movement for what I call bail reform, bad bail reform. Uh, which has really made the criminal justice system a whole lot worse. And I went to this hearing and I came out going, this judge is, is going the wrong way. She doesn't understand the issues. She's going to rule wrong. And we need to become experts on these issues. And so I set out with my legal back, you know, my legal appellate background to become very versed in, in these issues. And I've written many articles since then. And I will say I, I was proven correct on, on 
what what my initial opinion is, was of this judge. This judge has been reversed seven, eight, or nine times now on bail reform issues. And ultimately, the Fifth Circuit ruled in its last ruling that the case that I was there uh, watching should have never been filed in federal court. And we're still suffering from the ramifications of her rulings. And, and the problem is, you know, we have a system that was working. We always need to look to improve it. Uh, but it had the lowest failure to appear rate and we're replacing it or we're trying out new things that have very high failure to appear rates. And when you don't show up for court, then your case has to be put on hold. And when your case is put on hold, you have to do something to get brought back into the system. Sometimes that's just you come back. A lot of times it's you commit another crime to come back. And so we're replacing a system that needed to be tweaked that was working well with a system that's creating chaos Chaos crea creates de facto decriminalization, and decriminalization is a green light for people to commit more crime. We know that. We have lots of data coming out to prove that now. We have California's data showing that if you if you release somebody just on a simple release, just for free, then uh, there's a 200% greater chance they're going to commit another crime of, of a violent offense in the next 18 months versus somebody released on a surety bond. So uh, we're seeing that uh, multiple studies showing that recidivism rates for people released on, for free uh, are a lot higher, which means they commit more crimes. They see that as a green light to commit more crime. And so you're starting to see a lot of pullback. You're seeing New York has rolled back their bail reform four or five times. California tried to extend it. There was a referendum they, that said no. You see the ramifications of what's going on in California when they stop prosecuting crime for theft under $950. Businesses close because they can't withstand shoplifting of $25,000 a day. Buildings start uh, closing because they, uh, they're not safe uh, for their employees to come to work. And so we know what works and we're, we're replacing what works in a lot of places or we're trying out theories that have never been proven, never been proven to work. And now the data is coming out showing that they're complete failures. And we still have people pushing them as the gold standard for what should we, what we should be doing going forward. And that's uh, crazy. So one thing I want to clarify too, just for the people who don't know about the like like when you're talking about surety bonds versus PR or personal recognizance bonds is that so when you when someone gets a, a um when some when someone is suspected of a crime and they get arrested then they um they go to jail and then they um a judge will they'll go in front of a judge as soon as the judge is available and then they will, the judge will set a bond. Um, and that if it's in a surety bond, then it's, then the, the person arrested will have to put up a, well through a bondsman or through a lawyer or someone who can put, who can make, um, who, who's authorized through the state to pay bonds it, they can they will have to put up that 10% of that bond right there and so that they can leave jail and then await further hearings for their case and then you, you know we have different we call it different you know each the bail systems are regulated by the states and then we have the federal system and so each state can be differently it can be different so what's called a personal bond in Texas could be called something else in California it's called release on zero bail in New York, it's called released without bond. But, um, and so it's, we, I kind of lump those all together and just call them simple release where you're being released for free. Like in Texas, we call it a personal bond. It has a financial amount tied to it because in Texas, a bond, bond has to have a financial amount. It's supposed to be a bond set at an amount that will ensure that you appear for court. And so even if it's a personal bond, it's, if it's for a thousand dollars, you didn't pay a thousand dollars. You didn't pay anything usually for it. It's just has a financial amount. It's your promise to pay. If you went to, if you posted a surety bond, it's $1,000. You're probably going to pay $100 to the bondsman uh, to post that bond and, uh, or a cash bond. And, you know, there's other things that Texas doesn't recognize. Like Illinois used to have pure cash bonds. Or you could post a percentage of the uh, bond with courts. 
uh, that's what they just got rid of. They got rid of surety bonds uh, years, several decades ago. As, as you can see, crime was going up. Now they've made it even worse because they were relying upon the, you know, the deposits with the courts to fund court operations. And now they've taken that away and haven't replaced that money. So, again, uh, reform is going to create further chaos in, uh, in Illinois. Chaos creates de facto decriminalization and de facto decriminalization creates more crime. And I would say that's what we've seen in Illinois for the last decade as they've gotten rid of the surety system and, and, and now that where they've replaced, uh, gotten rid of what was left of p- holding people accountable. So um, my question on that is what the, why, if they're decriminalizing certain, like certain offenses, why would that create more crime? Wouldn't that lessen the amount of crime that's, that's going into it? And what's the... What are the numbers that you're seeing on that aspect? Well, you know, that's a good point about, you know, when you decriminalize crime, you can make it look like crime's going down. But, you know, when, you know, you go to San Francisco and the Nancy Pelosi Federal Building tells all the federal employees work from home, it's not safe for you to come to work in our building anymore. I don't you can't call that less crime. Uh I mean, you don't have public safety when you when you decriminalize crime. You have a lot of chaos. So, why does de, de facto decriminalization um, create more crime? Because you know we have this. I would say in our urban cities we have this group within a group. We have the city of Houston, and inside that city of Houston we have this smaller city, which we could call Crimeville in city of Houston because we have, you know, a lot of the crime is committed by the same groups, organized crime, gangs, and career criminals. So uh, if we were to t- address that group, we would probably address over 60% of crime. Uh, and but you've got another gray area living between the two cities. That's like, I can be influenced. Am I going to live in Crimeville? Well, if nobody's going to be held accountable, I'm going to move to Crimeville or, you know what? People are being held accountable. I don't want to go to prison. So I'm going to, live in Houston. And so what de facto decriminalization does, chaos does, it overwhelms the system. You know, if you, let's use a simple example. In an urban city, you have a thousand people have to show up for court in a given week. If you're using the private surety system, predominantly, you're going to have a 10% or less failure to appear rate. So that means a hundred people are going to fail to show up that week. But if you're using uh, personal bonds or simple release, if you look at the statistics from Houston, it's an 80% failure to appear rate. Uh, In a week, if you look at what's going on in California, the misdemeanor court, it's an 80% failure to appear rate. If you uh, look at some other statistics, you could say, well, it's 50%. But let's just use a 50% number. If, I mean, it just dominoes the first week, 500 people don't show up. So the next week you have 1500 have to show up. So then 750 don't show up 750 plus a thousand, you know, I'm not good at math, but it just dominoes. And when you do that, the reason why it puts pressure on the criminal justice system is, you know, we're always adding predominantly this, you know, on average, the same number of cases to the conveyor belt of the criminal justice system every week. Anything that slows it down, creates a backlog, puts pressure on the courts to just dismiss cases to keep the system from collapsing. And so as the backlogs get bigger, they will dismiss more cases. And if you are a criminal and you're like, hey, I never even went to court and they dismissed my case, I can do this again. If you don't have accountability in the criminal justice system, then you're People will see that for what it is, a green light to commit more crime. And uh, the reason why I have hope is because what's going on is not sustainable. We cannot continue down this path. Uh, That's why you're starting to see in New York, you've seen people defend themselves. You saw the DA just come out and say he was not going to prosecute somebody who got into a fight with somebody in the subway system. And they, the, uh, the perpetrator had a gun, the guy, uh, fought him, got the gun, and then there were shots fired and the perpetrator got fired. I mean, uh, got killed or shot. And the DA decided not to prosecute the the victim, you know, the person who was attacked. You're going to see more of that. We're going to have 
vigilante justice if the poli- if the communities are not going to provide public safety. So um, that's why I'm like, it's, this isn't sustainable. It's already impacting our corporate, I mean, our commercial buildings values. I mean, you've got buildings in California selling for 30% of their value from a year ago. Um, and you're going to start seeing uh, defaults. Then you're going to start seeing city defaults. And you've got um, the mayor's already calling for change. Uh, you can look at Oakland and is the prime example. The NAACP in Oakland, that chapter said, we've got to have a state of emergency on crime. And first they said, oh, you're just right wing. Uh, you're just repeating the right wing talking points. The governor recently sent in uh, uh, additional uh, California Highway Patrolmen to help address uh, crime. And it has helped. It's just it's t- to the point where I don't know it's going to take a lot more than 75 additional officers to uh, cause crime to go down. I have so many questions to ask, to ask you. Uh, uh, starting, starting with, um, you said that uh, the system that we have now is, is worked, but it needs to be tweaked. Uh, I'd like to hear what your ideas of, of tweaking. What, what do you think would be the perfect system? Well, you want to, re- okay, well, what's the purpose of bail? The purpose of bail is to assure that you will come back to court uh, to address the charges that have been filed against you. So the perfect system, I would say, if you're a first-time offender, I might just release you. Uh, but if you are not successful on that, then uh, accountability would say, I'm not going to give you that again. So I may not, I'm not going to give you a personal bond a second time. And we've got examples in Houston where they're getting 10 15, 16, 17 personal bonds back to back to back. And when they fail to show up, they just get arrested and re-released again. Um, I think any system will work, uh, but it uh, will work better if you have a layer of accountability on it. I mean, we get, I think the old system or the, the system that works currently, if, you know, if you fail to show up for court, they just double your bond or they do in some areas. Well, that's the consequence of you failing to, uh, do what you promise to do, and uh, if and I think the courts have to have a layer of accountability. If we're if we're taking all accountability out of your promise to show up for court, then why be shocked when you don't show up for court? Uh, so I would say yeah, you have to, was, any system has to have accountability. You answered my you answered my question, and you answered my second question. You didn't even know it. <laughs> I was going to ask because uh, I was going to ask it. Well, I mean. It seems to me like there that there should be some kind of a. I, I thought there was some kind of a consequence for not showing up for court. I mean, how many of these? Is there a statistic for how many people that are no shows eventually end up in, back in court, anyways? Uh, ooh. well, you know, I did a podcast with a, a DA from uh, California, and he said that California and their misdemeanor courts use just simple release. So that's what they do for all misdemeanors. So their misdemeanor courts across the state have an 80% failure to appear rate. Now, we don't hear that. But an 80% failure to appear rate, because if you miss court, they they can't go get you because it's a misdemeanor. You know, like Texas will not go to another state and extradite you for a misdemeanor. So uh, we're like right now, today, Tarrant County will, their jail is full. So if you fail to miss court and you're a misdemeanor and the uh, police find you and take you to your car, their car, uh, the Tarrant County Sheriff's Office will not confirm the warrant. And so you'll be released because the jail's full. Um, and so that's one way to ha- handle jail recruiting. It's not a good way. It's going to make it worse. It's just, uh, and they don't realize it. Uh, so I think that um, you have to, I mean, look, I mean, if you're not going to hold people accountable, then you're just going to make it worse. Um, because uh, during the, during these last couple of years, the groups that are finding out what the new rules are, organized crime gangs and career criminals are, are making money hand over fist. Uh, look at the catalytic converter thefts by themselves. Uh, that's across the country. Now, what, the, the, the statistics on crime that, we, that I think is the most valid is car thefts because insurance companies still require a police report before they'll turn to de- uh, before they'll pay off the claim. And so you're, you're seeing in a lot of our urban areas, uh, car thefts go up 25% a year. I mean, in some areas, they go up a lot more than that. Um, but overall, um, on a nationwide basis, our crime statistics are still 
static or going down. And that's because we're still using for the predominant majority of the country the tried and true methods of, of criminal justice, of what we know works. These theories that are being pushed by our friends on the, um, on the extreme are not even any method that's ever been tested. There's no research that says it's going to work. It's just, hey, this is what you should be doing. This is the more fair thing. And, you know, the Vera Institute says any reform to the criminal justice system is going to carry a 40 percent failure to appear rate. And that should be OK. A 40 percent failure to appear rate will destroy or crumble the criminal justice system in our urban areas because they have too many cases being added on average every week. I mean, look in Harris County. We just got a report in Houston that the Houston police officer or police police department had closed 200 and over 250,000 cases and they marked it with the reason why they closed it was lack of staff. Lack of staff. They were bragging last year that crime was going down. Now we know why. They were hiding the numbers. Hmm. Um, you said so much stuff there. I, 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 it's kind of hard to know where to jump back in on all that. We were talking. Okay, you were talking about. Um, is your main, your primary problem with the way that with the PR bonds and all that, the the, the no shows for court, or I mean, because that seems to me like your pro, like like the solution isn't necessarily PR bonds. It's it's having a stiffer penalty for not showing up for court. Well, but if you know if you if the stiffer penalty for not showing up for court is you don't get another PR personal bond, then all you're doing is making it worse for the defendant. I mean, if I was a judge and you came before me, I would be I would be looking at you and say, "Do you have a criminal history?" Because criminal history is the most is the best probably um, evidence of whether you're going to do something again. So if you come in before me for as a judge and or if you come before me and I'm the judge and you have no criminal history, it's a low level crime. Uh, I would I would consider releasing you on a personal bond. But here's what I'm doing. I mean, you are already a lost child because you're in the criminal justice system. You don't know how this works. You're not, you're no you, don't, you, you don't know what you're, you're supposed to do. I mean, so. I mean, I'd be like, if I'm in an urban city, I want you to have somebody that's going to walk you through the system. And it's not going to be a government agency. I'd want you to have the um, uh, private industry bondsman so that they could ensure that you come to work. I mean, they're ensuring that you're going to come to court. But if you if I gave you a personal bond and you didn't show up, I sure as heck wouldn't give you a second one. And if I get and if I've increased your bond, so if I if I gave you a thousand dollar bond and you don't show a personal bond, which is it didn't cost you anything, it's just a signature, but you don't show up, so I double the bond or a ten times the bond to ten thousand, and now I require a personal bond. I mean a, 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 um, a surety bond. Well, now your your premium's gone from a hundred dollars to a thousand dollars on. When I know that just giving you a personal bond, the failure to appear rate's at least 50%. So there's a 50-50 shot you're not going to show up for court, either because you overslept or because you just didn't know where to go. You got scared. And so I, you're, you're going into a worse position just because on the type of bond that I, I gave you as the judge. If you've got a criminal history, I'm going to set your bond higher. And I'm, I'm not going to give you a personal bond because uh, you have come, you've got a more serious offense, if you have a criminal history, well, then I'm not doing it because I'm not doing you a, a, a favor because you've got a, a, a criminal history. And so that requires more supervision in my mind. And, and the best supervision that's provided is provided by the private industry. The biggest difference between a personal bond and the private industry is if you don't show up for court. If you don't show up for court on your personal bond, they're just going to issue a warrant. That warrant's going to go down the hall, and it's going to jo- go into the warrants department. It's going to join all the other warrants waiting to be served. In the urban areas, that's tens of thousands, which that means you have to either come in willingly or that means you have to commit another crime to come back into the system. If you're on a, uh, a bond that's been posted by the private industry, they're – they're calling you right away. Hey, did you re- remember you had court today? And if you, oh, crap, they'll walk you through what, what you can expect. This is what we need to do. This You need to get you back as soon as possible. Or the, if you start running, then there's going to be somebody that will be looking for you. Uh, so you'll be looking over your shoulder. So the purpose, 
the big difference between the private industry and, and, and these simple release measures is getting your case back on track, getting justice to the victims as quickly as possible. You know, one of the things I've learned very early as an attorney is justice delayed is justice denied, and that's absolutely true. If you delay it, delay it long enough, they'll dismiss your case. You can find Shakedown merch, graphic novels, and other projects at waywardpress.com. That's W-A-Y-W-O-R-D press.com. If you would like to support The Shakedown, get exclusive content, and watch episodes live, you can support us at patreon.com slash the shakedown. Like, subscribe, and leave a comment to give Malone that inner peace he so richly deserves. <laughs>